And I see you started recording, which is wonderful. And so, hi, um, welcome to a really interesting event. I hope you will like it. I will not introduce the panelists. I'll leave that to our moderator. I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm uh, Oliver Specht, the director of the PhD program in media, art and te text here at VCU. And MEDX is very proud to sponsor this event. So now I'll give it over to our moderator. Hello everyone, my name is Kaylin Banks Coghill. I am a first year media art and text doctoral student and I will be your moderator for today. Um, today, I just wanna go over a few house rules. We will be having a question and answer at the end. There's an option at the bottom of your bar for you to click and um, type in your question and then I will read them off at the end to our panelists. So please try to hold all questions. Um, if you have any comments, you are more than welcome to leave them in the chat. Also, this is being recorded for future viewing if you are unable to stay the entire time. So I'm going to introduce our panelists and then I'll go through the agenda and then we will move forward. So um, I would like to introduce Lauren Garcia, who is an MATX doctoral student and graduate affiliate at UNC's Center for Information, Technology, and Public Life. She studies the digital aesthetics of alt-right groups and their social and economic ties to mainstream Republicans. And she's also my cohort sister. Um, next, we have Christopher Irving, who's also in our cohort, um, teaches narrative media in the communication art department and has worked as a comic book journalist and historian since 1997. His published works include Conversations, Larry Hama by University of Mississippi Press, Leaping Tall Buildings, The Origins of American Comics, and an assistant editor role at Eisner award-winning comic book artist magazine. He is currently in the MATX department and is working on his dissertation on comic books and media. And last but not least, we have our honorary guest and panelist, Tabby. Tabby's pronouns are she, her. Tabby is a nerd that happens to also be a sociologist. She studies how internet memes are used as rhetorical devices by members of digital communities to produce, reproduce, and reinforce racist ideologies. So uh, we have some really awesome people on the panel today. I'm really excited. We will have a brief overview of what the alt-right is with some vocabulary provided by Lauren. Um, and we will begin to discuss what happened on January 6th. And then we'll have the audience Q&A and closing comments. Hi, everyone. Um, if you hear stomping, my neighbors are monsters. Uh, I love to put things in context, and I know that not a lot of people know these terms. They're kind of nebulous in our discourse, and so I like to provide conversation, um, I mean definitions, to enhance our conversation so we can be specific about what we're talking about. Um, so I did a little poll of my Twitter followers, which are not very many, largely political, and I asked if they knew what paleoconservative meant. And uh, I think between 70 and 80% said no, they hadn't heard it used in daily conversation. Um, and paleoconservatism is the ideology of the alt-right. So the alt-right is a seemingly disparate group of far-right actors that came to prominence uh, in mainstream discourse during Donald Trump's election. They, the term alt-right is used for a number of different groups, um, but they all organize and radicalize uh, in similar ways with similar people. Um, as I say here, they've become a modern catch-all group. Uh, they become a catch-all group for modern white supremacists. Um, so when we think of white supremacy today, we kind of think about the KKK. You think about like backwards hillbillies are white supremacists, um, but that's not true. Uh, so their ideology is paleoconservative. Paleoconservatism is um, a type of conservative ideology that's considered traditional. So in America, we call it the old right. Uh, that more explicit racism, uh, if you're familiar with politics, it's Barry Goldwater. Um, if you're not familiar with politics, it's uh, anti-immigration, anti-interventionist. So don't believe in going and fighting wars for other countries. Don't believe in giving aid to other countries. Um, they're juxtaposed with Ronald Reagan in the 80s, started this more um, 
neoconservative ideology that is about uh, trade deals and getting involved in other countries. Um, and paleoconservatism kind of uh, rallies against that as more of a populist with more of a populist ethos. Uh, and then we have QAnon and 4chan. So QAnon kind of boomed in 2018, uh, made headlines and made headlines again this year, January 6th, uh, because they are another kind of catch all for this right wing organizing, this radical right wing organizing that happens. Um, but QAnon is a conspiracy theory that started on 4chan. So 4chan is a message board it's a message board that's text-based and also an image board, but it's completely anonymous, um, founded in 2003. So it's like a, an old kind of what we call first world website. Uh, it's very crude graphically. Um, it was overtaken by far, the far right, um, frequent violently racist imaging and messages, um, violently uh, homophobic, transphobic, sexist. Um, and a lot of people are radicalized there and a lot of conspiracy theories proliferate there. Um, Q is one of them. So QAnon did not start on 4chan, but it really like grew on 4chan and then subsequently 8chan when 4chan got a little bit more moderated. Um, QAnon started off as a conspiracy that there's this big world global cabal um, that's a sex trafficking ring. Um, and Donald Trump kind of grew as the savior coming to save all the children. And there are a bunch of different branches of conspiracies um, off of that main conspiracy that can fall under QAnon. Um, but that one is the most uh, reported on. Um, and yeah, that's a little overview. If you have any questions about any of these terms, if you have any questions about like the background, feel free to just drop them in the chat. Also, you can talk in the chat. We love, we love some conversation. It's so interesting that you pointed out that he's the savior. I saw something recently where he gave a talk and there was actually like a giant golden statue of him, which the irony of these really conservative groups doing that was really entertaining to me. Oh, they love an idol. They don't believe in the, that commandment. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna jump into the questions. All right, so January 6th, right? We all know what happened, but of course we're gonna have our panelists give you an overview. Um, and we're gonna start with why did this happen? Tabby, you can start um, and then we can just, you know, popcorn it to the next person. So really, I feel like the beginning of this is probably more on Lauren. I would just say like I focus on internet memes and digital communities and the way that these sort of uh, digital rhetorical devices or artifacts are used to produce and reproduce culture. So and, and it's kind of become uh, an adjective like the idea of memeing. So to me, I feel like there is probably a fair amount of that at play. Um, people that went along with it more because it's a joke. And I think that humor as this rhetorical device has also become this sort of call to action for a lot of people. And I don't think that it's a conscious choice. Um, but I think a lot of it also relates to like the legitimacy people feel about these sort of QAnon theories. And that really is Lauren's area, so. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I go back to, so a lot of people ask me to talk about QAnon because this is like my area, this is my thing. Um, but they actually, I, I actually had a talk that was supposed to happen this month that got canceled in December because Joe Biden got elected. And so it's one of the most important things for me to impress upon people is that this happened because of larger structural forces, right? Like it's not just a, a group of crazy people. This is like half the country that believes in these theories. Um, like in some aspect of these theories, not everybody believes that, you know, there's a, a child sex trafficking ring, but everybody distrusts elites. 
Um, and so I think that the, the erosion of trust in our government, in our news media, is why this happened. Um, because a lot of people believe conspiracy theories. I mean, a lot of people think the news is fake news. I mean, we just were talking in our, Kaylin, in our, um, in our media framing class about how, you know, distrust among Black and uh, Asian and Hispanic communities in the media is at an all time high. And so um, looking at that erosion of trust is important um, in maybe like figuring out how to make this not happen again. Uh, but those are, those are big questions with big answers and big gnarly solutions to untie. It's been really interesting to see how this has sort of been uh, absorbed into culture as well. Um, I have had lots of experiences with people that are uh, parroting or uh, parroting or referring to these QAnon conspiracy theories or QAnon adjacent things. And some of them haven't even heard of QAnon. So it's really become part of like just our common discourse at this point like and I guess that's because it taps into so many of like our cultural values um I don't know I just think that that's kind of been really interesting to watch is people participating in these groups without even realizing that they are and then the way that they go on to spread that discourse especially in things like YouTube videos that people follow on these like political commentators that people just assume because they don't believe in mainstream media anymore that these people are like telling it how it is like they don't trust mainstream media so i guess they're willing to trust a random dude on youtube <laughs> if i may ask how much do you think is a generational thing i mean i, I have um some older people in my life who are more likely to follow what they read on Facebook, but they won't read, you know, the New York Times. Um, do you think that the disinformation affects an older audience? Do you think it's a generational thing? I think that it's a multi-pronged approach by these groups. Um, they use different iconography to draw in different groups of people. Like, it's definitely like when I did my research, it was specifically focused on uh, gaming communities and the internet memes that they shared. And so we have this young demographic that's getting it from these more like comical sources. But I think that the older generation has things like, um, like random, random websites that are, what's the one on immigration that we've talked about before? Uh, FAIR or um, the Center for Immigration Studies. It's, so it's a propaganda site. Yeah, yeah they, they're more likely to go to these propaganda sites. That being said, like I know plenty of old people that are also sharing internet memes on Facebook. Yeah. So I think it's kind of just coming from all directions for people. And it's a very, um, okay, I can't say that I empirically know that this is intentional. Um, but there are so many different approaches that it seems, and there's so many material, like economic financial ties between groups that um, it seems coordinated. Um, so like Tabby looks at video game, uh, discourse in video games. I mean, somebody, a basketball player yesterday got in trouble because he said the K word, um, a racial slur for Jews. And he said he didn't know what it meant, but he was gaming while he did it. And like, I don't think people understand people on um, online were talking about how they haven't and never heard that word out loud. And like, they can't believe that word is still in rotation, but me and Tabby know it is. And so if you're disconnected from those younger gaming communities, you wouldn't realize that. Um, but it's also happening in a more like academic way. So you know, they're modeling after journals and um, think tanks. So they produce white papers that are explicitly uh, eugenicist. And so like, like Tabby said, it's like multi-pronged. It's like coming from all different directions, which kind of makes it such a hard problem to deal with. 
All right, uh, we're gonna move on to the next question. What's with the outfits? <laughs> um, which I'm really excited to hear um, you all speak about it, especially Tabby and Chris, because I know they really look at comics and I was like, wow, cosplay, interesting. Yeah. So yeah, take it away. Would you like to go first, Tabby? Okay. Uh, I, I say the worst cosplayers ever. Um, the worst G.I. Joe cosplayers ever. Um, it's, it, it's funny, like the whole, you know, cosplay is such a common thing now. Um, when I started in, in comics in the 90s, um, mid to late 90s, hardly anyone showed up in costume unless it was like San Diego, you know, which is the big convention. Um, I think, I think it's part of the hyper reality, you know, um, you know, I feel like many of these conspiracy theorists, like they live in their own constructed reality. And I think part of that is they construct an identity with it. Um, so, you know, they'll, they'll dress in whatever either outlandish outfit or they'll, you know, dress however they can to intimidate. Like when you look at the guys in body armor and, and camo. Um, and so I think it's part of trying to create an identity that empowers them enough to be intimidating or perhaps to convince themselves they're doing the right thing. I don't know if it's a weird disassociation with who they generally are. I, I would love to hear any thoughts on that. Um, but I think it is part of this just warped view of reality. Well, and it's kind of like a fandom now, right? <laughs> like it's, it's, you know, the whole point of cosplay originally was sort of an homage to the characters, but it was also a way for people to connect through that shared imagery or shared costuming. Um, you know, culturally, that's a thing that we do, right? Like, especially with subcultures, like when we see people that are wearing a t-shirt for the same band that we listen to, that's like a shared cultural thing that helps us connect. It creates social ties, like, mm -hmm. and I think that's it. Like this kind of cosplaying as these like paramilitary boogaloo boys it, it, <laughs> right. it's, it's a fandom to them now and the the world is their convention i guess so mm. to me cosplay is really the perfect way to talk about it because it, it is them playing this role it's a character that they've sort of created within these these groups and they're all trying to participate in that and form those social ties and strengthen that group and demonstrate their ideology through that. Uh, that's in, in may I, um, I have one confession to make. I've not told anyone on campus, um, but about, oh, I don't know, 14 years ago, a cosplayer friend of mine convinced me to dress as the flash at New York comic-con. And it was a pretty good costume, I got to say. But I was just curious what it was like for cos. That's when cosplay was starting to really kind of blow up. And it's insane how like everyone, there's like, they're the fans and then they're the cosplayers. But I noticed that if you're in a costume, people stop you. You're like this, if it's a good costume, even if it's a bad costume. Um, and so it's a way kind of like you were, working off what you said, it's a way to relate, right? Um, and it's a way to kind of form a, a society. But you also, I think for people who regularly cosplay, I really do think it's a way to feel empowered and comfortable in their own bodies even, you know, maybe more so than they would, um, you know, in, in everyday life. As a complete non-secret, I've been cosplaying since like 2000 and absolutely yeah. I agree with that. I just wanted to add a piece about, um, I think a lot about this idea of the spectacle of whiteness. And so like, yes, this is identity formation. This is um, community formation, um, but it's also like, a, a, I know a big part of Tabby's work is that video games comic book culture, this nerd culture, you, you say nerd and it conjures up an image of like a, a lanky white man with glasses, right? And so like, <laughs> that was no shade. Um, so 
it's like it's fine if it was <laughs> it's a it's a it's a place it's a I don't want to say it's a breeding ground but it's a very um fertile soil for white identity formation explicitly um everything about the universe caters to that um and that's not unlike the real world um I do think that because media specifically has been trying to be representationally more uh, inclusive, they feel victimized. Mm -hmm. So just like the people who are like, they took our jobs, feel victimized um, by a narrative that's playing out. A lot of these folks do as well. Uh, victimization is one of the highest, like one of the easiest ways to radicalize they found in the psychology literature. And so um, the white identity piece is very interesting and important to me, always. And really that's what makes these communities such a utile place for like um, recruitment by these alt-right groups, right? Um, it's, it's like a reclamation almost for them. And uh, I found that this sort of these sort of edgier memes end up being used as like a social currency within these groups and these and a lot of these guys are angry um so the memes tend to be angrier and the more angry or the more offensive your memes are the more respect that you get within these communities and it just sort of feeds into that idea they're like people agree with this extremely aggressive or extremely racist meme and it it just reinforces that idea that that these things that they're talking about whether it's implicitly or explicitly through these internet memes is true and they are victims and it's i mean I think we've all had that time when we sit around with our friends complaining about, I don't know, like an ex because you've broken up and it just goes back and forth and it just reinforces those sort of negative concepts that people have and it reinforces that you're in the right. And these are just these huge communities because we have so much access to these wide audiences. And I think that there's almost this like I don't think a lot of people these days have a distinction between their uh, physical relationships and their digital relationships. I know that that's something I suffer from, so. Um, and if I may add on to that, in terms of comics, there's um, there are a couple of groups that are, um, some of them have, you know, comics professionals. Uh, they call themselves uh, Comics Gate and they are very toxic and they are misogynistic and they're, you know, I would say a majority of them are, you know, middle-aged white guys. And they're complaining about, you know, oh my goodness, they cast a black actor in this role instead of a white one. Or now this character is a woman like, you know, Jane Foster's Thor. So, oh, it's awful. And, and what's so sad about it is that they then, there's one artist in particular um, he complains that he's been canceled and he's not getting work. It's like, well, guess what, man? What publisher actually wants to, you know, have you your credit on their book because you're a racist, misogynistic, and you put it all out there for everyone to see. Um, but what I will say is that the comics community at large, as in industry professionals and so forth, um, do really group up against this element, you know, maybe not enough, but there's a lot of um, kind of calling it out on Twitter, for instance. And the sad thing is what that does is it further kind of increases their sense of victimhood because everyone's after them. Um, I don't know. I imagine it's just as bad with video games. Um, I'm not really too, I'm a little familiar with some of the things that have gone on um, but it's, I mean, it's, it's gotta stop, you know, and, and I, yeah, I would love to, to know anyone's thoughts on that. Well, we can just roll into the next question since you did bring up video games and comics. Um, so the last question is, does video game slash comic book culture lend itself to radicalization? So to kind of go off of what Chris just said, um, 
I mean, I think it does. <laughs> yes, the answer is yes. Um, but especially with like comic book culture, there is that it, it is a push and pull, right? Um, people are pushing for more representation, but there's definitely that blowback. Um, a big one for me was many an argument when uh, Black Panther first came out, um, which is interesting because just Marvel Comics in general has always sort of tried to push that agenda of more like representation, but they like to sort of demean it rather than just looking at the movie as a movie, there was this whole push that it was a movement, not a movie, and to kind of downplay it and complain about SJWs taking over the comic industry and the MCU and whatever else. Um, and I think that that's sort of uh, delegitimizing of these characters and sort of ignoring the roots of those characters or reappropriating them like they have with Punisher. Um, is really, I think, just a way that they're trying to take over the narrative, if that makes sense. Yeah, and you know, it's, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, there's a certain ownership, and, and I think this might also go with older comic book fans, which are people probably around my age, I'm 44. And I, gosh, I remember being in a comic book store when Avengers, um, Infinity War came out and there was this guy buying his books and he must have been in his early 60s or so and it's almost like he felt he needed to apologize for being a comic book fan he did like you know and and he was like oh there is teenage girls in the audience going like oh I can't I, I'm gonna die if the next one doesn't come out on time or something like that and I'm I'm like dude the, these kids are in love with the same characters we are you want more people to come to the party, right? Um, and I think it's a matter of not so much that, but it's kind of, I call it the clubhouse effect. Kind of this, oh, we want more people to come to the party who look like us and we want this to be for us. Um, you know, but what I say about Black Panther is much of the 70s work that the film was based off of was written by Don McGregor, who's a white man who um, had to actually really fight to write a Black Panther comic book set in Wakanda with a, a predominantly Black cast, then Christopher Priest's work from the 90s. Um, I mean, you're gonna hear it, you know, the, the casting actors of color in, you know, in roles for characters that have traditionally been white. Um, it's, I think it's sad because we should ultimately want as many people to love these characters and identify with them for as many different reasons um, as possible because that's going to keep them alive. Um, but I think that there is that misogynistic <laughs> kind of, you know, um, that, that group that has had issues with, you know, women create, women creator, uh, well, you know, LGBTQ creators as well, um, creators of color, um, editorial, all coming into comics. We've seen a real influx of that within, I'd say, the last 15 to 20 years. I think it's a great thing. I think it's a wonderful thing. But I think it's very hard for some fans who have that level of ownership and uh, narrow-mindedness to admit that they're making comics better and that now more people can love them. Well, and I guess that goes back to what Lauren was saying, like these, these spaces, these nerd, nerd spaces mm -hmm. are seen as predominantly for uh, upper middle class or middle class white straight men. Um, so anything that's trying to change that dynamic is going to set people off. Um, I like that you brought up misogyny because to me, uh, incels and the alt-right are like, two yeah. little peas in a pod. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what, what I kind of the rule and I tell us to my VizCom students, um, I look at every change that's made in every different type of character and different type of creator as what I want my son to grow up with. Because I did grow up with, um, you know, mostly white characters in media. You know, I grew up in the 80s. Um, you know, I, I will say I love G.I. Joe because 
the comic book by Larry Hama because it has a diverse cast. Um, Larry is um, a Japanese American and he wrote this like really great book where all of the characters, um, whether they're black, Asian, white, um, Native American, they all work together. And there's this just camaraderie that it was very rare for much of the media you saw in the eighties. Um, so yeah, you have a bunch of white dudes, you know, my age who, who were so used to growing up with media just for them. Um, you also have an industry that cut out the female readership by I'd say the 1950s, you know, they had romance comics and by the sixties, when superheroes started to take over again, um, publishers started really just focusing on what was basically a, you know, a boy's fantasy figure, right? Then in the 70s, you had a whole slate of creators who were comics fans, mostly white male dudes come in. And what did they do? They, many of them, with like Don being an exception, wrote comics for other white dudes. And so it had this weird inbred thing. And so when you have this infusion of creators like Becky Cloonan, um, you know, and you have like Christopher Priest as well, that Chris has been at it for a little while. Um, but when you have them coming in and really kind of coming up, that's very jarring and uncomfortable for this very narrow group that's used to everything being for them. So I was wondering, Lauren, hopefully not to put you on the spot too much, but I just want to hear your voice some more. <laughs> as our resident, not total nerd, what what does the iconography this sort of like nerd culture iconography mean to you when you see it because i'm talking about how like the punisher has been co-opted but i assume for someone like you the punisher is just what it's been co-opted into i always viewed this culture as violent towards me um in my positionality so i never I remember when I first started dating my boyfriend, um, he brought me to a comic book store and the discomfort, like this is not a place for me. Um, and so it's not really all that different uh, now. <laughs> and it makes complete sense for me to see these images co-opted. So for a person who enjoys these uncritically without like, you know, a person who is in a different positionality from me, who found safety in these spaces, um, it's very, it's very, I guess, disappointing. Um, but for me, it, it doesn't. Yeah, of course, it's white men doing what white men do, being violent. And video games, it, to me, are violent already. Um, so it just, it just goes hand in hand, I think. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was just curious, there's nothing to be sorry about. It's um, a, a rule I made for myself back in the late 90s um, was that if I didn't feel comfortable bringing my sister or a girlfriend who isn't a comics reader into a, any comic book store, then I wouldn't give them my money. And I'm, I'm very glad to say that there are more and more that are female friendly or uh, the one in Willow Lawn is, is owned by two young ladies, um, they're in their 20s, so I'm, I'm showing my age here, um, Alex and Bree. Um, so it's getting better, but there was a period, especially in the 90s, where um, comic shops were not welcoming to um, anyone who, who was just not a dude, you know, like a mostly straight white man. But um, I, I'm glad to say it's changing, but a lot of that is because the industry is changing and the industry is gearing towards a higher readership. Sorry, everyone, I was in the chat, I'm excited. Okay, um, all right. Do you all have any um, closing statements that you would like to say about any of the, the topics before I open the Q&A? Because we do have a couple of questions. No, no? All righty, so let's go to the Q and A. Okay, so, okay. Uh, 
Okay, so Aurora, Aurora, would you like to come off mute and ask your own question? Hmm? Are panelists able to, or are, is the audience able to come off mute, Tyler? Not sure, I know sometimes there are. Yeah, let me yeah, see. Let me see. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hi. Hey. We have two really, really good questions, and I would love to hear them speak, if they don't mind. All right, I've brought Aurora over, and if she can unmute, there we go. All righty, Aurora. Hey, can you all hear me? Yep, okay, great. Um, first of all, this is a, a fantastic panel, so thank you to all the panelists and to Kaylin for moderating and to MATX for doing this. Um, my question is, um, so in my day-to-day -day life, I actually do not come um, in contact with a lot of explicitly alt-right people. Um, what I do come in contact with are what I would say are um, violently moderate people. Um, and I'm wondering, it, because I studied business and one of the um, uh, main ways that you take advantage, full advantage of a market is you create your product, but then you also create your own competition via a generic. And so I'm wondering, do you see a way in which the moderate or the middle are being radicalized into being in the middle as a pipe, possible pipeline for alt-right? Because I can imagine that the alt-right knows that not everyone is gonna be all the way down for their, um, their ethos and their, you know, their mission, but I would imagine it would be cunning of them to uh, create a culture of moderateness such that they can then work on them and convert them as needed. Um, whereas allowing them to be converted by the far left. Um, I'm just seeing, it, do, does that resonate with anyone or is that a thing? Um, because that's kind of my issue on the day-to-day -day is like overly moderate people who are basically all, or who are basically on the right, but are have branded themselves otherwise. This is my favorite question. I love it. Thank you so much. Um, I don't think that there is a specific disinformation campaign happening with alt-right and moderate people. I think moderate people think they're not racist. I think everyone thinks they're not racist and everyone is racist. So our, our society is under what Sonia Renee Taylor calls a white supremacist delusion. So we are structured with white, cis, um, hetero males rich at the top, right? And then all of those other identities in varying um, combinations at the bottom. You can see my cat. Uh, <laughs> um, and so I think that our default is white supremacy, right? And so um, even somebody who is a political moderate is going to traditionally favor policies that favor um, white rich males because everything is set up like that like we don't even have um as a society a framework to think outside of that and that's why when we say hey maybe let's not lock up children people are like oh but why like we can't just get rid of prisons like we can't just get rid of police because it's so taken for granted um and just like embedded into who we are as a society um and so, yeah, I think that the, the colorblind racism, colorblind racism is, oh, I don't see color, mm -hmm. but by not seeing color, you're erasing blackness. Mm -hmm. um, and so colorblind racism is kind of like the neoconservatism that came up and the neoliberalism that came up in the 80s and 90s with Reagan and then Clinton. Um, and that is violent in and of itself. It's, it's institutionally violent. And so uh, you can see it often at a place like VCU, not VCU in particular, but any university, right? Um, and so an interesting thing about this is on the left, we're kind of like antagonistic with each other. So the far left, me, Antifa, um, does not work well with a moderate left because our goals are just too opposite. But a moderate right and the far right 
their goals are in line, even if they disagree on process. And so it's a really interesting ecosystem where some people say, oh, the soul of the GOP is gone. Like, guys, that's the soul of the GOP. We just called it something different. Um, and so I think what you're getting at is the difference between implicit and explicit racism, right? Um, we've been pretty happy with implicit racism and not as accepting of explicit racism. Um, but, you know, that's why when you search on Google Trends, like I was doing last night, because I'm a, I'm a nerd in my own right, um, racist jokes was a search term that was big back in the day and has decreased. Uh, but black memes, Mexican memes has increased. So we just call these different things now, right? Um, but ultimately it's all white supremacy and ultimately it's all harmful in different ways. I'm done. Thank you. Well, and then with you talking about implicit versus explicit racism, like when I was coding my stuff and when I was doing my research, I definitely thought that um, there was going to be more of that colorblind implicit racism. And what I found was like in these communities, um, there was like a varying degree of how okay they were with explicit racism. And I think that kind of relates to your question, Aurora, because I do think that it's kind of like dipping your toes into the pool and like slowly going in for a lot of the people with these communities. You know, they start out in this community and over time they just work their way over here to Naziville. And I don't know. And then, sorry, just another thing. I don't know if it's a tangent. With the implicit racism or the colorblind racism, a lot of how we see people sort of becoming okay with these ideas or starting to um, more blatantly agree with them is that a lot of like the internet memes that are popular use black and brown bodies as the framing without explicitly stating or showing any sort of racist ideology in them. Um, it's just through our associations, like our cultural context. Um, a lot of them were like animals or savagery related that were using black and brown bodies. And that that's a message there. There's coding there that we can't really um, process without having those negative connotations towards black and brown people. I hope I made that point. I feel like I started rambling, I'm sorry. No, you didn't, I was nodding aggressively. That was great. Uh, <laughs> um, Chris, do you have anything you would like to add before I move to the last question and open the floor for anyone else? You're muted. <laughs> uh, I thought I unmuted myself. No, you, you two are, I, no, I'm good. I think they covered it all. Awesome. Anthony, do you want to ask your own question or would you like me to answer it, ask it for you? You could put it in the chat or you can, we can um, have Tyler give you the option to speak. Okay, uh, I'll just read them for you. Um, so the first question, Anthony asked a couple of questions. So I'm just gonna go through each one and whoever wants to jump and take it, um, you are more than welcome to. The first question is how young do, the, do these propaganda tactics start? Very good question, Anthony. I was wondering the same thing. I mean, in relation to internet memes and gaming communities, absolutely as young as you let your kid play. Um, you know, I've had to be really strict with my son in what he is allowed to participate in. Like he really wants to get on Discord and has since he was probably about 11. And these sorts of memes and these sorts of ideology are being shared in these communities, even for games like Minecraft. So I would say as young as people are letting their kids go wild on the internet, which is probably pretty young because I don't, think or I guess what I found was that humor is being used as this rhetorical device and parents or just people in general aren't taking it seriously because people don't take jokes seriously as rhetorical devices. Chris, would you like to add anything? I know yeah, you're also um, a parent. Yeah, I, I think um, 
I mean, my son is three and we're, um, we're, you know, very cautious about what we, what we let him watch because that can have an effect on him. Um, and I think that we're it just from studying media and, okay. So I look at some comics that I grew up with in the eighties and nineties, and there's no way I would let my kid read it because they are inherently racist. Um, you know, they, they, they feature stereotypes and um, they feature uh, even like a certain humor, um, which was acceptable at that time. Um, in the 90s, there was a lot of very inappropriate shock humor, right? It was all about pushing the boundaries of censorship um, but it was also about just um, really getting people's attention. And so I kind of my feeling is that we have to, those of us who are like my age, um, you know, we need to be aware that there's this cultural shift, right, into us finally really stepping back and exploring what is and isn't acceptable, um, because we need to change that for our new generation coming up. Um, but not every parent is, um, I, you know, I feel has that type of discretion with kids. So kind of piggybacking off what you said, Tabby, um, I think that it, you know, the, I get a lot of conservatism being like back in the old days, you know, the way things were, um, a lot of people keep that alive with their new generations. And that's, that's not good because there's no way we're going to progress as a society or as a people until we have those difficult conversations, which are not easy. <laughs> I'm still learning them myself. I'm always going to be learning them because I want to have a better sense of them by the time my kid's old enough. Um, so I think the big worry is the accessibility of these things online and in media. Um, you know, when you looked at a lot of what went on with Donald Trump, you know, it's the first time I had to mute the TV when the president was on. So, and just to kind of, and I guess I'll say a trigger warning and then ask Kaylin if you can go to the World War II sl slides. Um, it's like towards the end, probably second or third to last. Um, so when I was doing my research and gathering all of these internet memes, I found, just keep going. I found that a oh, lot- There are no, this is where it ends. I got you. Okay. okay. A lot of what were being shared were these World War II memes, and they're in these formats that would be very appealing to a young audience, very relatable and understandable. And the whole purpose of these is to sort of soften the, the like, because, you know, World War II is a very normally taboo subject. Um, and the purpose of these is to really like subvert those social mores of ours and make it okay to share them, downplay the seriousness of what is or was at least previously agreed upon as being like one of the more or most horrific things in recent history, right? Yeah. Here are these ridiculous memes. But these are being shared in groups for kids playing video games and you have to think about what effect that's going to have on a 10 or 11 year old child um, how is it going to affect when they actually learn about world war ii um, they're turning hitler into this almost like adorable figure that's so cute and relatable and and i think that that does lend itself well to as these kids get older and as they spend more time in these communities or interacting with these digital artifacts, I think it helps normalize this sort of belief system. Right. And, and th this was the biggest category of memes you found, right? And we, I know that in our conversations, we were thinking that you were going to see a lot of like anti-Black memes, which you did. Um, but the fact that there's this weird historical thing happening is super interesting. And like a, a, re, um, a reinvigoration of Nazis, um, which I think kind of, if I may, goes into Anthony's second question. Um, 
Is this stemming from the military industrial complex? Many video game sites are being advertised by the military. First of all, gross. Second, um, I think that the best propaganda is um, ethereal. So we don't know, like as much research as Tabby does, she will never know who created these images, right? Um, so it seems like they're coming from nowhere. Um, and that gives them a certain authority. At the same time, we have a culture who valorizes violence when we commit it to other people, right? Like we think that soldiers are the coolest. Um, we honor military people as if they are um, gods and that's connected with this. And so I think that this is as successful as it is because we're painting it on the backdrop of a society that already thinks it's cool to invade other countries and perfectly reasonable to commit genocide and mass murder. Um, so we, we're already primed to just accept things like this. And so when you start as young as you are with these video games, um, it just creates a new source of like teaching for kids essentially. I, I know that like a big thing on TikTok was that kids were like, didn't know who Hitler was or like had like thought Hitler was cool and also think Helen Keller isn't real because of conspiracy theories on the internet. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really incredibly dangerous, um, but it only happens in an American or like, you know, this Western context where colonization is cool, violence is cool, as long as it's us doing it to other people, you know? And okay, so now I have two tangents I want to go on. The first is related to what Lauren said with the propaganda. So these are some of the memes. I have documented a lot more that are just straight up World War II propaganda. And I think that that's part of what it is, right? You see these jokes and these memes, and then you see propaganda and that makes you more likely to believe it, which it leads into that sort of alt-right QAnon uh, discourse. Um, and then related to what Kaylin said, um, where you can't post memes that are racist, homophobic, etc. Lauren, would you mind going to my meme culture one? <laughs> um, when I was doing my research, what I actually found was that um, these Discord communities, they create their own rules. And it, it wasn't just that it was humorous. It was that that kind of edgy humor was rewarded. And also it was creating this sort of space where they weren't being oppressed by SJWs or really left ideologies. Sorry, I just wanted to get that out. <laughs> just get it out there. Uh, we have one last question from Anthony. Um, Anthony says, can you please speak to the phrase I've heard in younger groups, this is the way? Tabby, do you want to take that one? Chris, do you know what that is? I don't know that that is either. So I, I have no clue. <laughs> so, and I, I actually gave a presentation when Uganda Knuckles was still relevant and there were pictures of him, but there's none in this one. But it was just this phenomenon that started in like VR games where people took this really warped picture of Knuckles from the Sonic franchise and gave him a really bad uh, African accent and called him Uganda Knuckles. And they sort of used him to go around and almost sexually assault random females that they would call their queen. And it really just kind of tapped into these racist concepts of Africans. And I don't think that, I, I don't think, I know, uh, because when I brought up that it was racist to friends, they were like, what are you talking about? And I had to really explain to them, like, th these are cultural contexts that they're tapping into that are inherently racist, but because of 
that sort of obfuscation that's happening by making it this character. Um, it, it's helping people reinforce those stereotypes that are inherently negative. And like, I think that the fact that Anthony has heard this phrase before, but has absolutely, it's completely separated from its very racist context speaks to how incredibly dangerous this is. Um, because with the proliferation and like rapid widespread uh, ability for memes and like digital artifacts to be shared, um, you're you're perpetuating things that you don't even know you're perpetuating. Um, and that's scary. Um, and I'm sure that while all of us are not connected, not all of us are connected to video game culture, um, we all know something that it came from a video game. Um, yeah. Um, and it's someone just a uh, quick soul. This is the way um, they do use that term in the Mandalorian, um, but it's also, um, it turns out a fanatical sect of Mandalorians that use it. Um, just kind of piggybacking off what Lauren just said, and it kind of ties into Tabitha's World War II memes. I think it all comes down to in ignorance of history or reality. You know, um, the uh, Knuckles thing is very much like um, Birth of a Nation and its depiction of um, Black people, you know. Um, post uh, re or during reconstruction as, you know, rapists and savages. Um, but I also, I, I find that I've run into this in some classes. I have students who don't know the basics of World War II and it's not their fault. I'm assuming that it's not taught in high schools. Um, I was lucky enough to have had two grandfathers who served and um, a, a dear friend who was like another grandfather to me um, who served as well. And so I had a little bit more of a sense, but then I realized, I guess within the past 10 years, how little I truly knew about World War II, like truly knew about it. Um, and so I think it, it all just boils down to ignorance, you know, um, and it's, I don't know, I, I'm starting to, I don't want to go off on a tirade or a tangent here, but I think it all boils down to people having the critical thinking skills to really look at what they're seeing and to question and challenge it. And I don't feel like enough people do that because they're used to just, you know, eating whatever media they're spoon fed, right? They don't stop to see, you know, whether it has like too many additives or like too many doses of racism or ignorance or xenophobia. They just, they just take the spoon and go. Um, and that's what I think is one of the things that the, one of the root problems of this. Well, and that comes back to, oh, sorry, go ahead. I would just wanna say like push back on the idea that this is about ignorance because I think that um, it's kind of like a cop out. Like people know, people feel, um, you can feel racism and it, it feels good for people. Um, I think that maybe even if we're not always conscious of it, we know, like, we know when things are racist. Um, we know when things are sexist. We know when things are homophobic. Um, I know that people, a lot of people maybe have not been around certain people before. And so maybe there's some level of ignorance, but I think that ultimately it's a very American thing. And I would also say that, um, I don't know if like people on 4chan, people in these groups would say that they are searching for the truth outside of institutional sources. Um, and so I think that like, it goes back to kind of how I started with trust in the media, trust in our institutions, trust in our government has completely taken a tumble um, for good reason. Our media is paid um, by the same rich people who lobby in our government, right? Um, and so it's it's not so much that they're being spoon fed as they're searching out sources that confirm their bias. Um, yeah, go ahead, Tab. I mean, we love to feel like we're right, 
don't we? <laughs> um, when we are given this media that confirms our beliefs, we're not only more likely to agree with it, we feel better about ourselves, we tend to believe other people that agree with us, all of that is true. Um, and it's really, what was it, the, the tagline for a lot of my research when I was working on it was that idea that it's funny because it's true also. Like, you know, people say that all the time, like, oh, well, stereotypes are stereotypes and they're funny because there's some truth to them. And, and that's what this is. It's a confirmation of these racist and racialized ideas through humor because the only reason we find it funny is because of how accurate and true it is. Whether it is or not, usually isn't. And it's it's culturally true, which I think is the point. Um, like culturally, like we do believe, I mean, I think that the polling is about 60% of Republicans over time think that black people are in the position they are in our society because they don't work hard enough. So that's a that's a very like floofed up way of saying some of the deeply and, and violently racist things these memes are saying when they depict, you know, uh, black bodies in certain ways. Um, so yeah, those are things that we as a society think are true. Um, and addressing that, that, the fact that we hold these horrific beliefs just as normal, normal people, um, to me is the way we, we handle it. Um, but yeah. So I wanna jump into um, a question that was gonna be a question that I was gonna ask at the end anyway, um, but I'm gonna, Aurora, would you like to read your um, statement or do you want me to read it for you? I can just read it because uh, it's okay. probably easy for me to talk it out. Um, so I totally hear both what Chris and um, Lauren are saying, and and I agree with both. Um, I think that we do recognize racism and that we can feel it. And sometimes we ignore that feeling to pursue our agendas. And talking and talking to my partner and my younger cousins and, and other people, like I was really lucky. I went to a governor's school where, you know, the education was prioritized and all this, you know, elitist shit, blah, blah, blah. Um, but when I talked to my peers and listening to the to what they to first of all to what was delivered in their history or social um, uh, or civic justice courses what have you um, and number one there was no really there was no real push to absorb that information um, and two that information was already flawed and biased and erased all of the um, lived experiences of POCs and all of the very real evidence of bigotry in our country. So um, in a lot of ways, I do really understand what Chris is saying in that, like, I know a lot of people who don't know the difference between Lenin and Stalin and like, or, or if there was a difference. And so if you don't even know that, how are you supposed to um, really form um, enlightened opinions about their effect on the world? And so um, not to say that the ed system is the culprit. I truly think that uh, Eurocentrism or ethnocentrism is really the culprit, but I think it uses the school education as a really powerful tool to make sure that the first story that people hear is one that they've curated. And I think that people tend to believe the first source unless, you know, given um, reason to believe otherwise. So my question then is, if let's just say that that is true, I know it's definitely true in the context of some of the people I've met, how can we, how can we tackle that should we tackle that or is there some other is that sort of like a, a red herring you know like is that a a, a a diversion um because i truly do think if you're going to form adequate opinions about race and things like that you do need to have a historical context i think that um without that historical con context is how we get memes about hitler being this playful adorable little like comedic you know blah 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 um and so like, number one, how can we make history better? And if we can't rely on our ed program, how are we going to instill this historical context in future generations? Sorry for the long question, just wanted to give some context and about my question. I think that 
I think that that's kind of what I'm arguing. I think that that's what I'm saying is schools have done that in America forever. Like history classes in America have always been imperialist propaganda. I mean, if you look at textbooks through the decades, I know that our textbooks come from Texas and they they reframe slavery or it was that they ignored that slavery existed at all. And like America does what it needs to do for the safety of everyone. And we just care about the world. And that's why we bomb people. Um, so that has always existed. It's built into how this country operates. And so like holding individuals accountable is, is a tough situation. Um, I don't know what we do to combat that when it's such a structural, like embedded, like deep problem. Um, because I can't go to Texas and be like, please stop, please stop. I can't get enough white people to sign a petition to say, please stop. Although maybe that's a way in. Uh, what do you guys think? I really have no idea. I was legitimately shocked. Uh, I grew up in Florida. So I assume that our textbooks are a little different when my son was in elementary school taking Virginia history, they referred to slavery as forced immigration. Um, and that was something where I had to sit him down and have a conversation with him like, this is softening what they're talking about. This is what slavery really is. And I don't know how, how we change that on a wide scale, right? Like. I'm a sociologist. I had the words to sit down and say that. I am softly a helicopter parent. So I read through everything he, he came home with. And it's something that's really scary to me. Like the fact that, you know, nine-year-olds are running around thinking of slavery as forced immigration is very concerning, but it's not like these these things are things that people didn't sit down and decide decide to teach right and that's obviously something where they're trying to spare children from the true like horror and atrocity of something um and without thinking of what the long-term consequences are so i don't feel like that offered anything helpful because it's, it's a hard problem, right? Like it our the entire foundation of our society and of our culture is, is built on the bones of colonialism and its impact. And how, how do we try to build something on top of that foundation that is going to take us past that? And I think that that's, really hard like i think it's the sort of thing where we need a new foundation <laughs> which is not something easy to come by yeah um i it's such a huge problem and i i mean i think just on a personal level the most we can do is kind of what you're doing with your kid you know you're making sure he's educated um and making sure that you know they don't grow up with this mythology of America, you know, um, so much of like what was coming out in during World War II and especially after was so mythologized. It didn't go into um, how many um, Japanese towns we firebombed during the war. You know, it, it didn't really acknowledge um, the atrocities that that were committed, you know, by us as part of war. Um, it's a very one-sided view, right? Um, and it's it's really, and again, I, I think it's the the great thing about right now, this moment, is that these things are finally starting to be more widely acknowledged and talked about. Um, you know, one thing I'm I'm grateful for, and um, I don't know how everyone else feels about this, but I did like how in his inauguration speech, Joe Biden referred to systemic racism as a problem. He recognized it as a problem. This is something that needs to be stopped. It needs to be fixed. Um, my hope is that we 
get things like the education system fixed within our lifetime. <laughs> I don't know. I was teaching uh, elementary school when No Child Left Behind started. And I feel like that kind of gutted education and set it back further. Um, but it's, it's going to take, I feel kind of like what you were saying, Tabby, is a complete just building everything back up. It's almost like we have to just start anew. Um, I, I don't know where we would start with that other than we just have to make sure the next generation we talk to in our classrooms, in our lives, are made as aware as we can make them about what you know, really happened. Something I get really concerned about is that once people acknowledge something is a problem, mm -hmm. a lot of times it feels like people are like, we acknowledged it, problem solved. And, yeah. and that's just something I constantly worry about. Like we're mm -hmm. in a moment that could be really useful, but I'm worried that we're not going to take it a step further. Like a lot of these like more moderate liberal people have acknowledged like, or, or just I've known a lot of people who since Trump has been elected have, have been very shocked to discover that we are in fact still very racist here. Yeah. And I almost worry that they're like, oh, I now see that racism is a problem. I've done my duty. And I just wonder how are we going to push them a step further? Yeah. That's exactly what I unmuted myself very abruptly to say is that um, it's another case of being disconnected from a historical context. And so a lot of folks um, I've known who are, you know, graduate school educated who are in this, studying this all the time, um, who have a familiar like oh, thank God that Joe Biden is president and he said systemic racism without acknowledging that Joe Biden is one of the architects of the structure of systemic racism. And so how meaningful is it for someone to say something like, yes, representation matters. Yes, um, hearing these things out loud matters, but that is the end of it for most people. For, for like almost all people. And so when people like me um, or people like Tabby are like, Joe Biden just gave $300 billion. I don't know if that number is accurate, don't quote me, but he just gave so an obscene amount of money to police departments um, while saying <laughs> all of these things. And so um, I just think that like, we need to demand more than, than speech and performance from our leaders, but I also understand that at a time where we have not had that, it feels soothing. Um, but I, I need us to do better and <laughs> um, actually push him on doing something, like follow up, see if he does anything about the problem that is systemic racism and look a little deeper because just like the right is masters of propaganda, so is the left. <laughs> And people don't like to hear that or acknowledge that. But, um, you know, when he signs some racism legislation that ends private prisons, well, private prisons don't even house the majority of prisoners. And he also didn't um, end private prisons for ICE facilities, which are the, the biggest users of that. And, you know, they're just transferring the inmates from private prisons uh, to public prisons. And it's just like um, so on and so forth, like really like, just like we're asking right-wing people to be critical, I would love for the message people take away from this to be like, we all need to be more critical. Um, I, you know, it feels to me like the past four years, especially maybe the past one or two, has all been about holding people accountable on like a, a mass level, you know? And it, it's, it's got to be kept up. I, I worry about about kind of um, kind of the, the the throttle being let go a little bit, just because you know things are changing, but we've got to just maintain this level of accountability. And I don't know about you, but I have learned more in the past four years about how the government should work <laughs> through the news. You know, like it's been the best civics course I've ever had. Um, in, in my 
my hope is that this generation who is going out there and kicking ass and be not literally, but you know, figuratively with protesting and letting their voices be heard, that, that they are going to be the ones who, you know, are you know going to be our representatives and are going to, you know, make help make the changes that need to happen. But it's it's just so much, you know. All right. So um, I did ask a question earlier, but it's really a good closeout question. Um, firstly, I just want to thank all of the panelists, um, especially Tabby for um, being our honorary guest and you know clearing out their schedule for us. Um, this was a very great conversation, and I'm hoping that we can have more conversations in the future through MATX um, because we have some brilliant people in our program. Um, and we also are connected to a lot of brilliant people as well. So my question, which is probably um, a question that many people have, um, I obviously identify as a black woman. It's very clear that I'm a black woman, um, but I do come from a family that is um, overwhelmingly poor, um, extremely un uneducated. I'm the first one to graduate from high school, all those things like that. And one thing that I struggle with often is, um, being able to find credible sources that are digestible for people like me and my family when it comes to trying to learn more about what the alt-right is or more about, um, you know, things dealing with politics or with um, systemic racism, so on and so forth, because I know that a lot of my siblings and my family members, and including myself, sometimes we are ignorant to these things because we're just not exposed to them, or we don't have access to the materials, or we don't understand what we're reading. So what are some credible sources that we can read, share, et cetera, with those in our community who may not um, have access to maybe, you know, a database or may not fully understand um, what these articles are actually saying or what the 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 newscasters are actually talking about and people who may even be on this panel um or listening to the panel may hear you all use some words or talking about some things they may not understand so um if you all could give us some of your fave resources or ways that you can encourage people to find this information that'd be great I really feel like I can't answer that question. I'm getting ready to start a doctoral program in fall and one of my primary goals is to actually take this information and put it out there in a way that is digestible and accessible by everybody. I think that these sorts of issues and the way that we're discussing them get sort of hoarded by academia. So I feel like one of the issues we need to be focusing on is academia's way of gathering but never actually disseminating information. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, are you referring to uh, resources in regards to the alt-right? Um, or just, just alt-right, just in general? Um, I see that Anthony suggested um, Bordeaux's thinking tools. I'm not really sure what that is. So if someone could explain that if they know. So the, that's one of, uh, that's one of Tabby's favorite theorists, Pierre Bourdieu. Um, there's a lot of, um, I think that black, uh, Latinx and poor people have specific lived experience of what Patricia Hill Collins calls, uh, or Kimberly Crenshaw calls the intersections of oppression. Um, and so like, we know this stuff. Um, when I started reading Patricia Hill Collins um, and you know, some classic black feminist lit, I got, I, I saw myself finally and was like, oh my God. Um, and so, you know, you can go to the library and get a book. Um, Again, I, I love, um, I'm looking at my bookshelf. Uh, Benia Silva has a book called Racism Without Racists. Um, I think that it's hard to get lingo without those readings. Um, but Aurora suggested um, teach-ins or like uh, 
folk education, which like there's a lot of different ways of passing down knowledge, conversations like this that are discussions that are um, a little bit more open where people can be free to ask questions. A lot of the time in situations like this, like Tabby was saying, academic spaces are cold um, and we need to make them warm and community education and political education is super important. And we're not, I think we have to acknowledge kind of to Aurora's point or earlier that we're not gonna get it from institutional sources. And so like creating new communities um, to do this or using the communities we already have is important is an important tool of activism and organizing. Um, if I if I may, um, <clears throat> I mean I can recommend a few books. Um, I I don't actively study the alt right, um, so I don't really have any academic sources. Um, I a book that I recommend to all my white friends is um, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man by Emmanuel Vaught, Vo I think I'm saying his name right. He also did a, it was an Oprah book and he did a video series on YouTube that I latched it onto that are just fantastic. Um, there's also Jason Reynolds and um, did a book called Stamped for Kids. Um, it's about uh, racism, anti-racism, racism and you. Uh, but for me, it's, it's learning about these things, you know, like constantly, but learning more and more about them so that as my son grows up, I'll have the resources that I can show him or that he can experience to, um, you know, to kind of have the tools so that hopefully he doesn't get sucked into any of these terrible things that are going on. And I shared a couple of my non-academic books that I've used in my research that lay out sort of the idea the ideas, well, I guess the ways that internet memes are used in social movements um, as recruitment tools. Um, it talks more about positive social movements, but it still talks about that sort of um, cultural reproduction of memes. And then another that just specifically focuses on the culture of memes and how memes uh, generate culture for us or reproduce culture for us. And they're both in the chat. So I don't have anything specifically on racism that I, Lauren didn't already share, um, specifically Black Sexual Politics by Hills Collins. Yes, I do love me some Hills Collins. Um, there are some um, options for you all for reading options. And we also had some really great suggestions. Um, if you all don't have any other questions, I'm going to um, have you all take a moment to look at the screen that is in front of you. It has all of our contact information. Um, so, oh, we do have another question. Um, Elise um, wants to know, how can we push the institutions that we work and study within to highly value alternative slash revolutionary methods of curating knowledge? So um, not to name drop myself, but I, along with my wonderful, uh, Tabby's laughing because she was there. Um, we put on this unconference called, um, it's, it's called the Race, Space and Place Initiative. And my wonderful boss slash big sister, Tressie McMillan Cotton put it together. Um, and we are trying to build spaces to have conversations like these in a larger format. So it's like 15 sessions over a few days where we break it down and we invite people who are not in the academy. I think that something that doesn't often happen is there's like a prestige hierarchy in higher education. And so like, you have to have your name and your affiliation. And if you're not from a prestigious school then you don't get looked at the same and you can't network with people. And it's very important to me personally that we are putting in the same room uh, grassroots activists and academics and practitioners from nonprofits and um, people who work in government. Um, and so spaces like that are awesome. And um, as far as like institutions outside of higher ed, I can't really, I don't know. I don't see a world where nonprofits actually get their shit together. Sorry, I cussed. Um, yeah. That's oh, okay. We love a little profanity. It gives us a spice of life. <laughs> um, I, if I may, um, I would, what I would encourage as a student 
is to find professors who allow you and empower you and encourage you to um, you know, take unique critical views and challenge the work um, or challenge the knowledge um, because they can be your allies. It's something I really try and do in my classroom, um, especially visual communication, which is 160 different students. So um, we watch different media across you know, the span of, of media. Um, and it, it's, it's so important that, that you're, that you can find a place where you can experiment and you can be challenged and pushed and allowed to kind of do those things. Um, but also, you know, call out your professors if, if you, you know, politely and respectfully, if you don't feel that you're, you're really getting that. Um, the biggest compliment that a professor can get is a respectful email that, asks about the material and shows that you're really engaged with it and you really care and you really love being in the class. Um, I, I hope that works. <laughs> I know it's kind of boilerplate advice. And you know, since you brought up Tressy, I would say a lot of the sort of public sociology that's happening on these digital platforms is important. Um, I, I think that honestly, I stray away from it all the time but i think we should be out there sharing this information with our own like little blurb about it i think that that's a good way to put it out there for people who aren't in academia right like there's so many professors that are sharing great information on these platforms and i think that that's not something that we're pushing enough I totally agree as a digital media scholar, um, using the internet and these platforms to get information out is chef's kiss. Um, and it's really great because a lot of these people are very receptive to questions. So if they are talking about something, they are open to having conversations with you to kind of help you better understand that. Um, that's where I get a lot of my information from. Um, are these platforms as well. So it is uh, reaching 1.30. I have thoroughly enjoyed being educated by you wonderful people. And I'm really excited that we had a lot of engagement and questions. Um, sometimes panels can just be people talking and no one is afraid to ask questions. Um, but you all made academia warm today, as Laura would say. Um, this is our contact information. If you all have any questions, um, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. We are receptive of emails. Um, and if you want us to have more events like this, email Oliver. <laughs> um, <laughs> you all enjoy the rest of your day. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Oh, you did a great job, Kaylin. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you all, all so much. I really enjoyed it. Appreciate it. All righty. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a good day. You too.